you're in Zechariah 4, say amen. amen. We're going to talk about grace to forge ahead, okay? Zechariah 4, 1, the angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? I said, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on the top of it, seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things or small beginnings shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. So about 2,500 years ago, there's a, a man living up in Persia. He's got it made, really. He'd been raised there, basically. His people, the Israelites, were in captivity. They were taken up there. And so basically, he had never really known what it was like to live in the land of his forefathers back in Jerusalem. But he began, began to get stirred. And he began to feel the call of the Lord to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple a work that needed to be done to destroy the glory of God. And so with great zeal and great energy and great effort and mobilization, bringing people alongside of him, Zerubbabel made the journey down from where he was down into Jerusalem. And they began to get the work done. They started celebrating and they laid the foundation of the temple. And the old cats looked at it and they said, this is so small compared to the glory of the one that was destroyed. We are going backwards. This is nothing like it was. But the young guys who had never seen the former temple were saying, this is awesome. This is great. We're rebuilding the house of the Lord. Quick note, if you look back in comparison, you're probably not going to be in a great place. But if you look forward in faith to what the Lord is doing, even though it might not in your mind look like it once did, something glorious can happen if you'll say yes. So Zerubbabel is doing all of these things, but there becomes this um, intense opposition. Natural warfare. People. People that were the enemies, people that were discouraged among the workers, and the work began to come to nothing. And when God wanted to, to stir back up the work of the Lord to rebuild the temple, what did he do? He brought a prophetic voice in. You got Zechariah and you got Haggai, and they were two tag team WWF wrestlers in the spirit. And they came up to Zerubbabel and, and, and with their individual messages to him and to the people, they said, the building of the Lord has to continue. The work of the Lord must not cease. Discouragement and weariness must go. This is a mission. This is a word from the Lord. And then they added this. And when it's done, nobody's going to be saying, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel. No, it wasn't going to be about him. When it's done, it was going to be about him. Because the testimony would be grace, 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 grace. You and I know the famous verse out of this fourth chapter of Zechariah. We know verse number, um, verse number six. Um, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. We know that, but do you know the context? The context of that famous verse is in, it's a word to an individual 
who had the life of God on him, the mission of God in front of him, but a lot of problems all around him. And the tendency, when we start getting smothered, we start getting stretched, we start getting bombarded, the tendency can often lead to us getting wearied, fatigued, and quitting, or fighting back in our flesh. Fighting back in our might, fighting back in our power, getting all of our resources, making sure ain't nobody going to get over me. And what we're seeing in this passage of scripture is something you and I are going to need and the church in America is going to need in this year. Because without sounding like a prophet of doom, hopefully sounding like a prophetic voice of truth, what I'm going to suggest to you is there's going to be a massive amount of opposition against Bible believing churches and Christians in the upcoming year. It is going to happen. And it's not all going to be from the government. Some of it's going to be people who name the name of Christ, nominally, religious, Christianized kind of looking things, people in places, they're going to turn hard on you and I who refuse to be silenced, who refuse to compromise, who refuse to allow the mixture to continue in the church without pushback. And it's going to be some heat. There's going to be some friction. There's going to be some sparks. There's going to be some collisions. And the thing that I want to know is when we get into this, we remember Zechariah 4, 6, that when we push back and we fight, that the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, are not carnal, are not natural, but mighty of God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so I think if we can walk through this today, we'll find a little bit of relief. And I do want to say to some of you who are under the mountain, it talks about a mountain of rubble in here. And I don't even have to be prophetic to know that there are some of you in the room and you feel like you're buried under a heap of rubble. Please listen closely to the word of the Lord this morning. God ministers grace to us in our confusion. Verses one through five, you've got Zechariah receiving the fifth of, I think, what will be eight visions in the book of Zechariah. I think this is number five, which, by the way, is in itself the number of grace in Scripture. And there's a whole lot of grace in this passage, but he gets awakened. The Bible says in verse one, the angel, an angel began to talk with Zechariah and he woke him up. He came again and woke me like a man who is awakened out of sleep. Just very briefly, I feel like, and if you'll just give me a little latitude this morning, I'd much rather prophetically apply this than to didactically teach this this morning. And so for my fellow Bible scholars in the room, you may not love my hermeneutics this morning, but I hope that you'll hear the voice of the Spirit. When, when the angel of the Lord comes to the man of God, he wakes him up. And Zechariah was asleep. Zechariah was just in the natural state of sleep. He's awakened out of his sleep. He's, he's alert. He's summoned in his spirit. He was once dormant, now he's lifted up. And when I read this, I think about the state of where we live. This nation is asleep. This nation is moving at a rapid clip in the wrong direction and totally 100% as a nation, completely asleep. Much of the church is in a deep state of slumber, intoxicated with wealth and riches and props and things to lean upon, movements and platforms and programs and very little travail, very little fasting, very little praying, very little weeping, very little um, uh, tarrying until the power from on high comes down. No, the American church is asleep. We pretend to wake up for an hour on Sunday mornings and then we go right back to our snoozing. Maybe not you and maybe not me, but I'm talking broadly. I'd probably just go ahead and risk it and say some in this room are asleep and some of you watching online are asleep. You're spiritually asleep. You're not tuned in to what's going on. You're not pressing in to know the Lord. You, you don't realize the severity of the hour that we're in. This is anything but business as usual season in the American landscape. Globally, it's not business as usual. There's a convergence of global events that are beginning to take place. And those with eyes to see can see the beginnings and the setup of this final stage that will be presented globally before the return of Christ. All of this stuff is happening. I don't care if you think I'm a conspiracy theorist or an alarmist, I don't even care anymore. I'm telling you, I see what I see. And so God, much like the angel did to Zechariah, God is sounding the alarm to wake us up and the American church has got to quit hitting the snooze button. Yeah. 
Zechariah gets questioned after he gets awakened. He, the angel says, what do you see? Zechariah is going to tell us in a minute what he sees, but it, it's a very important question. What do you see going on right now? What do you see happening all around you? What do you see in the spirit? What do you see in the natural? What do you see in the, the, the man-made order? What do you see in the government? What do you see in the religious sector? What do you see in the, the places of warfare and battle between Islam and Jews? What, what do you see when you see those reports? What, what do you see when our borders are flooding with people that I promise you, they're not all people that we need to be sympathetic towards? What do you see? Is that normal? It's not normal at all. What do you see when churches can host Trans Day? They, where, where they bring in transgender people to celebrate a defiance of the design of God in their life. What, what do you see? I see a nation in decay. I see a nation that's divided in so many different ways. I see a nation, quite frankly, that's depraved. I don't know that people are becoming more and more evil. I kind of think that they are. I don't want to underestimate the depravity of generations gone by, but I've never seen such blatant, flagrant, in-your-face displays of depravity and defiance against God. I see a nation without leadership. I don't know who you're voting for in November, but I'm going to tell you something. When, when you vote, and I hope you will, don't put too much hope in that vote. Elections matter and there are consequences, but I'm going to tell you something. I see a nation without leadership. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, has America so crossed this unseen line that a godly man or woman actually can't get elected anymore? I see a compromised church. A church that wants to play the part on Sundays, but a church that loves the world Monday through Saturday. I see a church without the Holy Spirit gifts and power. A church where the Holy Spirit is welcome to come as long as he doesn't do or say anything. A church where healing is no longer expected. Miracles are laughed at. Conferences are being set up to tell people why they shouldn't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. That's actually happening. That's straight out of the pit of hell. Sounds just like the devil to try to convince a massive amount of Christians that there is no supernatural power. Doesn't sound like something the Lord would say. It sounds like something the enemy would say. Now see a church that is losing leaders left and right with scandals happening in places we never thought scandals would have happened. Amen. What do you see? The angel said to Zechariah. I see a church that would rather fight with each other than fight the demonic realm. What do you see? Lest it be all bad news, I'm going to tell you something else I see. I see a, I see a uh, ravenous remnant who will not settle for anything less than awakening. I see that. I see a, a hungry, thirsty remnant of firebrands that are saying, yeah, we see that out there, but we see something greater within us as the body of Christ. I see a praying bride who's longing for the return of her bridegroom. I see a generation of believers who are desperate for truth. Gen Z wants truth. They don't want trends. Trends deceive us. Traditions enslave us. Gen Z says, where's truth? Tell us truth, preacher man. We don't want all the stuff. Somebody tell me what's true. And I see a spiritual incubator. Spiritual incubator from which will emerge a consecrated fiery move of God. That's what I see, and I see that more than I see all the other stuff. Whatever holds your gaze will determine your inner atmosphere. And if you're fixated on all the bad, you wake up in the morning and your new instinct is to see what nastiness happened in the world, you need to recognize that you've fallen into that trap. The bad news will find you. Don't go looking for it. Some of y'all are just waiting. You're scanning every day. Who's on the Epstein list? How's that going to help your spirit? How's it going to help your spirit? 
Many of you are as broken hearted as I am about the scandal in IHOP KC. I'm broken hearted over that. But it doesn't help my spirit to find out every day and get into the sparring match between both sides of the aisle. Let the Lord disclose it. Why? Because he keeps the one in perfect peace whose heart and mind is fixed on him. So what do you see? So Zechariah answers and he tells the angel, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on the top of it and seven lamps on it. Seven lamp, lips on each of the lamps that are on top of it and there are two olive trees by it. One on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Um, I'm, I'm really not going to get into all the imagery. It's heavily, um, it's, it's great, but that's not my point today. It's very Jewish, very symbolic, has a lot to do with the restoration of Israel. Um, but the olive trees are very important, and I'll talk, touch on that in a second. But I, again, I want to focus on Zechariah's question. I want you to be Zechariah, by the way. Can you just put yourself in his garb for a moment? So Zechariah is being shown something by God. The angel is saying, what do you see? Zechariah says, here's what I see. But then he asks this question. He's like, what are these? Like, what do I do with what I am presently seeing? And that's the question for us. What do we do with what we see? Zechariah needed instruction about the revelation he was receiving. He, needed to, he, he knew that there was something in the bigger picture that he was meant to, to gain from connecting the dots from the elements he was seeing in front of him. You got the menorah, the candlestick, you've got the lamps, you've got the lips, you've got the oil, you've got the olive trees, you've got the light. And he's just saying, you, you, you've woken me up to show me this. You ask me what I see, I tell you what I see, but I don't know what to do with it. Such oftentimes is the dilemma of the prophetic. You get snapshots, you get things from the Lord, you get words, you get phrases. That's why Paul wrote, he said, we prophesy in part. We don't always have the crystal clear, but does, just because you don't have clarity on the, in it on the moment, don't get lazy with it. If he showed it to you, there's something in it. So Zechariah says, what is this? In verse five, the angel comes back to him again. Interesting conversation. Do you not know what these are? Zechariah gets humbled. I mean, he's the prophet. He's one of the two primary prophets in Israel, and the angel is showing him this glorious revelation, and he's in the context. Everybody's living in this stagnated project of rebuilding the temple and getting everything going again. And he's like, no, my Lord, I, I don't know what I'm seeing. I don't know what to make of what I'm seeing. We, we gather every Tuesday night from 4 to 8 p.m. to pray. And if I could simplify it, somebody asked me recently, why are y'all praying for four hours? I was saying, because we can't pray for five. <laughs> Probably could, but part of the reason I come is because my senses, my mind, my spirit, my life is bombarded with all of the stuff in the world. I'm not talking about sinful stuff. I'm talking about the world we live in. Constant noise, constant communication, constant news reports, constant, it's in your face. If you don't unplug, then you, 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 you become an ongoing perpetual target for all of this messaging, most of which is not edifying at all. But some of it I need to know. I keep my eye on the Middle East because the Bible does. I keep my eye on Jerusalem because the Bible does. I keep my eye on, on the confederation of nations because eventually there's going to be 10 of them. They're going to come with a fury on planet Earth. I keep my eye and my ear open when I hear about global economy because the Antichrist regime will have a global economy. I, I, I listen when I hear about social credit scores that will not allow you to buy or sell or eat if you don't pass social credit scores. You do realize that's all attached to biblical prophecy, right? But what do I do with it? What do I make of it? 
I get into this room at four o'clock on Tuesdays and it's not cool and it's not glamorous. I walk in and it's, it's usually just starting out me and maybe two or three other people. And I get in here and I just say, God, I need the silence. I need the quiet. I need the stillness. I need to wrestle through my, my, my own impatient flesh that wants to be doing something. And I know I can't start doing things until I hear from you. It's a weekly reset just to come in. It's not the only days we pray, of course, but that is the time where we gather together. And when I look at our county and I look at our city and I look at our church and I say, why all the warfare over the last couple of years? What do you see? Some of you are new here. But we came here a couple of years ago, almost three years ago, on a mission from heaven to bring an opportunity for this house to steward true awakening and revival here. To tear down the strongholds of religion. To establish a praying people of covenant. To seek the face of the Lord. To identify and raise up leaders and to eventually send them out. To offer a new wineskin. To pry hands off of the old wineskin. And it cost us. What do you see? Why would, why would hell fight a little bitty church on about 10, 12 acres in Barrow, Georgia? Why the sickness? Why the division? Why the fighting? Why the outrage? Is it just boys behaving badly? No. It's a straight on assault from hell to prevent what God wants to do through this house. And I don't always understand it, but I get in here for about four hours a week. And we'll meet again this Tuesday. Hallelujah. Yeah, it's been two weeks off and oof, it hadn't been great. We'll meet and we'll say, Lord, help us make sense out of the things we see, we hear, and we discern. And we'll do it again the next week and we'll do it again the next week. And somehow over the last two plus years of having done so, almost three years, we, we, we have a much better picture of what the Lord is saying, what the Lord is doing. But it didn't come because we said, well, if God wants to tell us, he'll tell us. We didn't just say, it's up to the Lord. We'll just show up, go through the motions. If God wants to bring awakening, he'll bring awakening. No, God brings awakening in proportional to the hunger for the awakening. Amen. And if you're satisfied and you're not hungry, you probably won't be awakened. But for that ravenous remnant that wants the fire of God to fall, we will see it. Verses six and seven, the angel has said, don't you know what these are, Zechariah? Zechariah is humbling himself. I do not know what I'm seeing. And so here comes the explanation of the vision. The whole vision was a message, not for Zechariah, but through Zechariah. He was the prophetic vehicle. Heaven was having conversations about a man named Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel didn't know that. Zerubbabel's a worn out civic leader. He's not a priest. He's not a prophet. He's not a religious leader. He has a heart for God, but he is a, if I can say it this way, he is a businessman who has been given authority in the civil structure of that day. And the message was for him. The whole arrangement, like when God starts speaking to the prophets about you, there's something significant going on in your life. And heaven was talking about this tired, wearied believer whose incomplete assignment needed to be finished. And this is what the vision represented. I'm not even going to get into all the vision much. But verse 6 tells us, here's the word of the Lord for Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Zerubbabel was facing impossibility. He's in the, in the natural, he's not going to win. There's no way for him to overcome what had happened to him in the natural. And he, like many of us, broke under the fatigue, the weight of the resistance. If I can pause here for a moment. You may want to, at the beginning of this year, put very near the top of your prayer list, God, build endurance into me. I'd rather have endurance than tongues. I would rather have endurance 
than an extra measure of prophetic power or um, signs, wonders, and miracles. Why? Because you can have all those gifts in the world, but if you lose your endurance, those gifts die. There's no place for them if you go into neutral. We need endurance. Zerubbabel needed endurance, but he had caved a little bit. And so the Lord is telling Zerubbabel something that's so gracious. He's saying, Zerubbabel, it's never been about your might. It's never been about your power. It's never been about you and what you bring to the table. The Hebrew word might is a word that refers to an army. Zerubbabel, you're being attacked by the other areas. They're coming against you. They want to want you to cease and desist. They're threatening your lives. Don't look to your army. I say that's a word for the church. I don't like what's going on in this nation. I am not too proud to tell you. I'm glad I'm an American. I thank God for this nation. I thank God for the people that have fought for it. I thank God for the principles upon which we were founded and where we once stood. We have a lot of scars in our nation. We all know about that. But there's not a place on planet Earth I'd rather live than here. And the people that don't want to live here, we'll help you pack your bags and go. This nation stewarded the gospel in a powerful way for a long time. And just like people need to be sanctified, this nation needs to be sanctified. Always have been. I've got no delusions about our scarred, terrible history. I want awakening and revival to come, but I'm not looking for the White House to bring that. And if you are, you're foolish. I want the right person. Listen, we're going to have to pick... But God, help the church this election season not to bow down at the altar of the elephant or the donkey. Pray with the fear of God on you because the word of God tells me in Romans 13 that he'll appoint appoint the one he wants to be in the White House. That's what it says. The powers that be are ordained of God. What does that mean? He'll give us what we deserve. Don't look to the army. And I just use that as our human defense. Thank God for our military. But that's not who we're looking to. Or by power. That's the second phrase. Not by might. Not by military armed forces. Not by a massive amount of people. And that word power indicates resources. Wealth. I'll take as much money as God says is as healthy for me. And I don't want a penny more. And I don't ever want to assume that God's desire for me is that I be as wealthy as I could possibly be because most people that make that their priority shipwreck. It's not about how much can we get. Your money can insulate you for a moment, but I'm going to tell you the fires that are coming will burn right through your wall of wealth. He says, not by might, not by power. Okay, well, if it's not by my might, it's not by my power, what am I left with? God says, my spirit. My spirit. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And that Lord of hosts is a phrase that indicates he's got an army. He's got the resources. He's got the power. He's got the battle plans. He's got the ingenuity. He's got the understanding. And so while all of us Christians are scrambling around at times trying to look for ways to make ourselves secure and stable, and look, be reasonable. I'm not telling you it's wrong to not prepare. I'm not telling you it's wrong to to prepare for the future in a wise way. But good night alive, there's this insatiable propensity in us to go hard after things that become idols because we begin to trust in them more than we trust in him. And you don't know it if you won't slow down and take an honest look. How do I know it? Well, where do my resources go? Am I hoarding my resources now because I'm afraid of the future? Or am I investing my resources now because I know I'm not taking any of it with me no matter what the future is? My time, my money, my influence. It's not the strength of numbers that prevail or individual attainments or resources. It's trusting in God that prevails. That's the whole symbolism of the two olive trees. The lampstand. The lampstand itself is the radiant light, the glory that Israel was supposed to bring forth. It could even symbolize on the, on the micro level the light that would come forth from the temple when it was rebuilt. 
And Zechariah is like, I can't do this. I, every way I turn, I'm getting fought in the will of God. And the Lord says, look at those olive trees. You didn't plant them, I did. You're not producing the oil that is going from those trees into the manure, into the lamp. I'm doing that. And as long as that lamp is attached to those trees, the oil is going to keep coming and the light will keep shining. Some of you need that right now. And so the second part of the prophetic word is this. There's a challenge. And um, the angel has been speaking to Zerubbabel through Zechariah. Now he's going to speak to the obstacle. Who are you? Verse 7. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. I dare somebody to reach out and grab that for your life right now. Oh, Jeff, this doesn't apply to my situation. My situation's worse. Well, you just word cursed the fire out of it. What if it actually does apply to your situation? What if it actually is a rhema word attached to the written word for you to use right now? Zerubbabel, listen, he had all around him visually the rubble from Israel's past failures. The destroyed previous temple, that came because they sinned against God. God sent down the invading army to teach them not to bow down to Chemosh and the gods of the Moabites and Baal where they sacrificed their children and pr practiced all this licentious sexual stuff. God says, yeah, that's actually not for my kids and if you're not going to listen to me, I will get your attention. How many of you know God will destroy, destroy your most prized little thing? You've made a temple of idol worship in your heart. He will bring it down. And you don't believe me? I'm going to tell you something. Don't, don't relegate that to the Old Testament. There's this thing called discipline from the Lord. And every son he loves, he scourges. Yes. So it's best to keep short accounts with the Lord so you don't have all the rubble. They also had the fear of the surrounding enemies. The rubble had the financial needs to, to, that had to be provided to rebuild the temple. Everybody that was once working on it became discouraged and critical and abandoned the project. You can read about it in Ezra 3 and Haggai chapter 2. All the people would be like, we don't want to build the house of the Lord anymore. Let's go work on our own lives. And then there were interference from governmental powers. That is coming to a church near you. I feel like I'm fighting unbelief in the room. Maybe not even human unbelief, but a spirit of unbelief in the room. That everybody's like, man, come on, keep it, keep it fresh, Jeff. Keep it heavenly scented with marigolds and blossoms. I'm like, no, they're actually going to start working against the church. Loss of momentum, Zerubbabel. That was part of the mountain. That's a big mountain. Everything he was supposed to be doing for the Lord had been resisted, opposed, and had its mountain in front of him. In between him and the will and the favor of God seemed to be this impossible mountain. And God says, hey, angel, you go tell Zechariah to tell Zerubbabel. Here's what I, the father, say. I say, who are you, O mountain? Who are you, great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you're going to fall. You're going to come down. You're going to get leveled. You're not going to loom. You're not going to tower. You that threaten and cast a shadow over my servant Zerubbabel, you're coming down. And I just dare some of y'all to reach out and grab that. I don't want to read a passage like this and then think that's not for me. I call that faithlessness. I want to read a passage like this and I want to say, oh God, give me greater faith. I want to see that mountain move. Then verse 7 says, the rubble will bring forward the top stone amid the shouts of grace, 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 grace. When you get to the top stone, that means everything else is done. It means the foundation had already been laid, but the building hadn't been built. And God just went ahead and prophesied to Zer uh, Zerubbabel through Zechariah. And he just said, oh, it's going to get done. Matter of fact, uh, the father has already shown me the, the, the capstone up at the top. When y'all put that thing in, everybody's going to say it was because of the grace of God. It was because of the grace of God. That's the day in which we live. Oh, hallelujah. Come Holy Spirit, help me with this. Whew. We need less reels and more revelation. We need less branding and more anointing. We need a whole lot less posturing and a whole lot more prayer. We need to travail more than we need to do the holy dance right now. 
I'm all for both. But I'm going to tell you, the holy dance means a whole lot more after it's come through a season of travail. We have got so much of us in the mix that I'm afraid at times God can't send revival. Why? Because we wouldn't be crying out grace, grace, grace. We'd be, we'd be crying out glory, 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 glory. Look at what we did. Look at how we did it. Come to our conference. Let me show you what you've got to do in order to do it like we do. Because after all, we know you want to be like us. It's nauseating. Doesn't mean there aren't good conferences. There are. I'm not blambasting everything. I'm saying get into the spirit of the thing that's in front of you and answer the question, what do you see? He's stripping us down to the organics in the American church. And a lot of the people that are there for the flash and the flare aren't going to hang around. The what's in it for me season in the American church is about to come to a swift end. With everybody saying, I don't know, I'm going to pick and choose. I got 35 churches in Barrow County I can go to. Which one is going to make me feel best about me? Which one is going to be the funnest place for my kids? Because after all, the kids get to decide what church we go to, right? Away with that nonsense. That's silly. Parents need to grow a spine. Got to have the coolest lights, the coolest stage, the coolest preacher. God help you if you're here for the coolest preacher. Good night. I looked in the mirror the other day and I said, Dad? Good. got to be grace. He cares who gets the glory. And I'm going to tell you, I do, I, I believe this. I don't, I don't have a Bible verse on this, but I believe this. I believe that there was a time, a long time, where God allowed anointing and favor and fruit to come from a church that still wanted to have their grubby little hands on some of the glory. I think he allowed that for a while. I don't think he's going to anymore. I think he's looking, F, why don't you just bring the team up, please? I think he's looking, I know he's looking. He's looking for some people that will be willing to acknowledge, I don't really know how to do any of what you're talking about, Jeff. A group of people that will be willing to say, I don't know how to do it, but there's something stirring in me and I know I can't keep being who I've been and doing just what I've done in order to experience what I've never known. And so Jeff, I'm just going to take that step through humility and just say, I don't know how to do it. But if that's what he wants to do and the end result is that he takes my lack of understanding, my lack of expertise, my lack of resources my lack of might, my lack of power, my lack of perfectly polished answers. If he takes all of that and lets me step into whatever he's going to do with really nothing, I don't know that I have much to offer except availability. He doesn't, y'all heard this, he doesn't, your ability is not as important to him as your availability. And I think that the firebrand remnant, forgive me for being hyper-Pentecostal, but I am. The firebrand remnant at the end of the age is going to be very unconventional. It's going to be third graders and octogenarians, 80-somethings. It's going to be some that are trained but didn't lose their faith and all their theological training and those who can't string together a five-syllable word next to a four-syllable word. But they've got Holy Ghost fire on them. It's going to be black and it's going to be white and it's going to be Hispanic. It's going to be male and female. Watch the daughters of God rise up. Listen, I'm, I'm not even pandering to the women because you don't need that. I'm just saying the men have dragged their feet so long and the women are sick of it. They're ready to see the fire of God fall. They want to honor authority and structure. And in the home, you must. In the church, you must. But nowhere did God place authority in the church and the home over women in order to suppress them and muzzle them. There'll be fire coming. I want to see our teenagers get flamed up by the Holy Ghost. 
That means the leaders have to get flamed up by the Holy Ghost. And I don't want to make it about our services. And so often we picture our Christian awakenings and explosions and glory stuff happening in this room. It will. But when it's real is when it's happening in a home post. When one of our home posts starts getting the fire of God in it and they're having to call somebody saying, uh, this is a little above my pay grade. What do I do? Holy Spirit is falling. It's when healings, healings, like verifiable healings that don't need any publicity, props, they just start happening. Why? Well, because when Jesus is around people that need healing, that's what he does. Listen, I, I speak to you as a guy who needs healing in his family. Amy's leg. I, I'm, not, I'm not using that as like, oh, we got all the answers. I'm just telling you, what do you see? I see something that doesn't make sense to me in my spirit while, while I know he heals and yet I have a need for healing. So what does that make me do? It doesn't make me want to figure out a, an explanation to make me feel better about why Amy's not healed yet. She is healed. It hasn't manifested. But I don't want to make up some explanation to defend God and why we're going on 11 years. No, what I want to do is say, I, I know what I see, but I don't know what to do with what I see. So I'm going to keep pressing in and I'm going to wait on you and I'm going to cry out to you and I'm going to believe you and I'm not going to let the mountain overshadow me with all the rubble that comes down on my head. Got to get reacquainted with the holy fight. Burn your apathy. Some of you need to lay your apathy on a fiery hot altar. Let the fire of God consume it. If you're not willing to walk through the mundane and the boring, you'll never experience anointing and fire. Everybody wants step one to be flay, fuego, fuego, fuego. It's not step one usually. You walk through the door of faithfulness and humility and you keep walking through that corridor of faithfulness and humility. And in and, and the third month or the fourth month and you, the fuego has not come yet. But you don't quit. You don't stop. You don't go home and say, well, Tuesday night prayer has been three weeks in a row and it hasn't been that awesome. What are you measuring it by? What you see? Would you stand to your feet? I'm actually really happy. I know my face just looks kind of scowling. I'm mad at the devil. I'm not mad at any person at all. Like I got nothing but love for people in my heart, but I'm sick of the enemy. I'm sick of the serpent's hiss and the fact that he walks around bearing fangs when I know he has been devenomed. I'm gonna make two appeals today. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ, or if you're not certain that when you did make that what we call a profession of faith, where maybe you asked Jesus into your heart, maybe you got water baptized in a denomination that told you that was sufficient, all you gotta do is be baptized in the water, you've got Christ, but you know in your heart, I, I, Jeff, I really don't know if, if my relationship with him is authentic. Guys, I say this, not a scare tactic, it's a plea of love. You do not have time to play around with this. And your pride or wondering what, whoever you came with, what they'll think, they're going to think it's awesome if you come and you give your life to Jesus today. That's what they're going to think. You could be a preacher, a prophetic team member. You could be an SL team member. You could be a first-time guest. I'm just saying, do you know that you know that your relationship with Jesus Christ is real? Has it made a transformational change in your life? And if not, I want to invite you to come this morning and we're going to help you. I'm going to ask for the prayer team to come forward, please. These prayer people, people of prayer, they're trained, godly people, love the Lord and love you. They'll just spread across the front. If you're here and you just don't know, man, you just don't know. I don't know if it's real, Jeff, or not, but I, I want to know. I just want you to step out of your chair right there where you are and come. Just come forward. There's no need to be embarrassed.
second group I'm going to appeal to is the ravenous remnant. That you're so hungry to see the finishing of what God has begun. That you are going to fight whatever you've got to fight through in your flesh, in the world, or the devil himself. Because you're convinced that we have not seen the greatest yet. I want you to come. I want you to find a place at the altar. And I want you to cry out however you cry out. You can cry out in the spirit. You can cry out with your understanding and your native language. But we have got to tap into the desperation and the hunger that is inside of every single person walking in the spirit. There's a lot at stake. And though it's going to be grace, 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 grace works through a vehicle. And that vehicle is a surrendered will. 